One ringy dingy. Welcome Rotarians and guests to meeting number 5,321 of the Rotary Club of San Jose. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Rotacare was our greeting line today. Thank you to Rotacare. Uh, any of you who know about Rotacare probably already support them. If you don't, please do. It's a wonderful service that we offer to the community. Uh, Rotarians with guests, please come up to the microphone and bring your guest with you to wave at everyone. Let's start with Octavia. It's all yours, Octavia. Hi, Rotarians. This is Mr. Brown from Unger um, Atom, CCTOC. Hello everyone, thank you again, and for Octavia, I, as well as Hunger at Home, definitely want to be more involved with uh, the Rotary Club, and we thank you for all the support in the past, so I'm here as Octavia's guest, she's a wonderful woman. We're not going to let you go, Denari. <laughs> go ahead, Octavia. Yes, Brenda, Test. Santa Clara, Aaron. I'm Brenda Igrari, and um, I'm a public health nurse from Santa Clara County, um, who with foster care, just recently retired, and uh, I'm invited by guest Octavia, and she's been a wonderful friend, and um, we uh, partner in the community. Welcome, so, Brenda. You. Enjoy yourself. President Steve, I'm Leah Schnoor with Notre Dame High School. My guest today is Stephanie Balansky Fair. Hi, everyone. I'm Stephanie Balansky Fair. I'm a realtor with Coldwell Banker, and um, I'm super excited to be here. And I love being involved with the, um, with the community. So, looking forward to that. Thank you so much for having me. Welcome, Stephanie. <laughs> Michael Conniff. President Steve. I'm happy to bring our, our uh, kilt man back again, uh, Matt Groban, and uh, he's, he's still in the running for that uh, best address. Uh, and uh, come on, say word. Uh, come on, kilt got, man. He's got, he's got a great voice. Hi, everybody. I'm Matt Robin. Um, I am kilt man, among many other things. So <laughs> I've been called worse, and I appreciate that. Thank you. Look at those legs, everybody. <laughs> Hi, President Steve, Irma Garcia here, introducing my guest in the back table. I didn't want to make her call up here. Sonia Koss, formerly with the city and county of San Francisco, visiting us from San Francisco, taking public transit all the way here. So Zoomers, I mean, the excuses are real low. Welcome, Sonia. And you get, you get bonus points for the public transit. Back to Octavia. Hi, President Steve. This is Father James from San Francis Cabrini. Hello, James. Hi, President, and uh, hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I couldn't say no to Octavia, so I got <laughs> to show up. Thank you. I'm looking forward to coming back. Okay. Well, welcome, Thank James. You. I'm glad you came. Hi, President Steve Pat Riley. I'm here with the guest, Niraj Perandari. Hi everyone, my name is Niraj Prandoy. I'm an executive at a software company here. Uh, Pat and I go back a long time. We were talking about giving back to the community and uh, thought that, you know, I should be introduced to the local club here. And I'm excited. Well, we're here to answer your questions. Welcome, Niraj. Octavia again. Hi, President Steve. This is Jenny Okana from um, San Francisco. Hi, hey, Jamie. Jean, I'm sorry. Gene O'Connell. I'm very proud of Octavia and I'm very happy to be here today. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Clarence. President Steve, thank you. I am delighted to introduce my dear friend, Mike Chappie, who I went to elementary school with at St. Mary's, just three blocks from here. Now, some of you know Mike is a member of this club, but he hasn't been here all year, so I thought it appropriate to give him an introduction. <laughs> I'm not sure whether to find Clarence or Chappie or both of them. 
Thank you all. Welcome to guests. Uh, everyone in the room, please uh, express welcome to all of these people who are visiting us and make them feel warm and at home. Thank you. Um, Megan Fluke, come on up. Megan, you here? Excellent. So Megan is part of our COVID cohort. She joined during the last uh, year and a half or so and, uh, and an old friend of mine. So with that, welcome Megan to tell us uh, her story. <laughs> Hello, it's so I'm Megan Fluke. Uh, I live in Willow Glen with my partner, Jeff, and our three kids, their ages are uh, six through 12. Um, I've worked to protect local nature and open space since I was 16 at Washington High School in Fremont. At the time, I was also a proud member of the Interact Club, which is why I bring that up. In um, 2007, while I was at uh, San Jose State, I joined the campaign to protect Coyote Valley in South San Jose. This is a 17,000 acre area of open space, farmland. Um, why am I so nervous? I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> um, uh, watershed and watersheds. So fast forward to 2013, um, I became the executive director of Green Foothills and I actually am celebrating my eight year anniversary this week. I'm really proud to be a part of this organization. It's uh, one of the best uh, roles I've ever had. In 2018, I was invited to join the second American Leadership Forum Diversity, Inclusion, Equity, and Liberation Affinity Group. Say that five times fast. Our now tight knit group of 30 nonprofit leaders explore what equity means to us personally, for local nonprofits, and for our community. I also serve on the board of directors for a new local nonprofit called the Moekma Ohlone Preservation Foundation. Our mission is to preserve, restore, and promote Moekma Ohlone lands, culture, food, language, religion, and any other aspect of Moekma Ohlone identity within the San Francisco Bay Area. I joined Rotary in March, thanks to Rod Dierdon. How many other Rod Dierdon recruits? Sure, there's a few, oh, there we go. Um, I was a part of the green wave of new members, so Rod isn't the only one talking about how we don't have a moment to spare for climate action. Um, I have to give a shout out to my mentor, Karen Lowe Fox, uh, Steve, Fernando, Rotary staff, and to the Red Badge Committee Chairs. You all really know how to make a new member feel welcome. Thank you, it's nice to be here. Clarence Stone, can you come on up here? Clarence and Andrew are going to talk about the foundation. And I'm sure it'll be riveting. Are you all on the edge of your seats? I guess not. Go ahead, Clarence. Thank you. Thank you, President Steve. By the way, Steve, these luncheons, President Steve, these luncheons have been fun and entertaining. Thank you. Uh, Steve has asked us all that come up here and speak to, um, to at this podium to make sure we have fun and make sure the make sure the uh, content is is engaging. But today's a serious matter, so no horsing around for me today. As your foundation president this year and last year, uh, I'm sure you've all heard me speak about the fundraising issues relating to the annual campaign. <clears throat> By now, you should have gotten a letter from me along with the form to participate in the annual campaign. Our foundation funds all of our club's activities and all of our community giving. That's what it does. There are essentially three sources of revenue, for those of you that don't know, for those activities, to fund our club and for our community giving. Those three, those three sources of revenue are the gala, interest and in income, dividend income from our investments in the annual campaign. That's it, those are the three sources. Fortunately, the endowment's done very well on, uh, uh, on its investing activities. The gala did okay last year, even in, as it related to struggling with COVID-related restrictions, we still did fine. Our annual campaign is failing. We're at 50% participation. Had it not been for the extremely generous contributions from large donors like our beloved Bob Keeb, who so generously gave us 200000 last year, we'd be underwater. 
The foundation board is determined to turn this around. We set up a committee. Annual Bales, Andrew Bailey's, the director of the Symphony of Silicon Valley, is going to chair it. Andrew, please give us your thoughts. Well, welcome everybody. Um, you know, Rotary is a collectivist venture. It's service above self. When Rotary International decided that polio was a correctable scourge, uh, it made a commitment that now has held $900 million over the last 35 years um, and countless volunteer hours to make that work. Um, when COVID first struck here, our foundation stepped forward. Uh, Catholic Charities needed a van to be able to take the services out to the community. And we stepped forward and made those choices and did them. Each time those funds were drawn from resources already secured so that the action could precede the need to find the money. Those people, money had been set aside for this so that we could make choices to address the needs. With 1 million members worldwide, each of us, every member here is responsible for $900 of that 900 million, everyone individually. Not sure who wrote that $900 check, but collectively it got paid, okay? That's, then I doubt that the members in Nigeria and Vietnam and some of the other worldwide places make a level that's comparable to that which we do here. So what we do here matters. And the money we set aside for the future matters at the international level and at the local level. We all view our membership in Rotary from a different lens, but at our core, we're a service club. Uh, we're assembled for the people and destination that represents downtown San Jose. That's the name of where we work. Outside the frame of governmental bodies, there aren't a lot of entities who carry this as their main portfolio. San Jose's prestige suffers as a result. Uh, we all remember the survey a few years ago when uh, uh, people from all over the country were looked at a list and asked the name 100 largest cities. And a sizable number didn't put the 10th largest city our own even on that list. That's how anonymous we allowed it to become. Each year we make an ask. Uh, oh, we have a commitment to San Jose. We've created resources to support it, to be part of it, to help. The tool that we use is the foundation endowment and the international level is the Rotary International Foundation. Each year we make an ask, but I'd like to change that. I think we have to make that a commitment. Uh, we commit as Rotarians collectively to support the mission of this club and its committees in order to serve our community, we need to continue to build the endowment. And we do that by stepping up with our annual gift. In any given year, there'll be members who have a hard time, circumstances make it difficult. They have to hold back perhaps. But I think on the whole, we know as we look around the membership, this club and the members we know of there, for the most part, that gift number is not a number we can't step up to. It's not about the number, it's about making the gesture and making the commitment and doing it. When I joined the club, I never thought of this gift as optional. Only after joining the foundation board did I see that the payment was not universal. Our participation rate in this campaign was typically about 80%. But the chart that was up there a few minutes ago, you saw it was down at 46% in the most recent year. It has dwindled. We have not made the participation in the growth of our foundation a priority. And that will catch up to us. And that will catch up to the city of San Jose and the services that we can provide. I mean, when it came time to give Catholic Charities that van, we didn't have to say, how the hell are we gonna pay for it? We had resources in place to step forward. Those won't be there if we continue to underinvest in the future of the endowment. I'm the bad cop here. Write the check. Get the participation level back up. Uh, it was only a few years ago that a select group of, did a special appeal to meet the demands of our annual community grants pool. 
series of Rotarians sat around, looked at the needs, looked at the requests, and found there wasn't enough money in the kitty to make it. And they individually raised the money to fill that slot. That was completely wrong. That is, that is our obligation, not theirs individually. Um, the strength of Rotary is, a, is, that's the strength of Rotary. Ignoring this annual appeal cannot be optional. We have to commit to return to the 80% plus. Write the check. It's the right thing to do. And it's our plan to uh, enforce this a little more, to uh, give you a couple of weeks to respond to the letter, which I understand just went out yesterday, so you haven't gotten it yet. But to respond to the letter and, and, and write those texts, we'll give you a couple of weeks, and then we're going to start calling. We're going to pursue this point in a more active way. And I ask you for one big thing. Don't make me make that call. Her mask is gone and my agenda is gone. <laughs> Teresa, would you bring me up an agenda while I make stuff up? Uh, Rose Simmons, come on up and uh, talk about Rotacare. Thank you, President Steve. Hopefully today I will have an opportunity to share briefly and tell you the story of Rotacare. In 1989, San Jose Rotacare Free Clinic was born as a partnership between the San Jose Rotary and the school health clinics, which were operated by the San Jose Medical Center. There are currently 10 Bay Area Rotacare clinics. Rotacare is a volunteer-driven, patient-centered provider of free health care for the uninsured and underserved in our community. In clinic visits and telehealth visits are available at the clinic, which is located at the Washington School, by appointment on the first and third Wednesdays of the month. Patients are seen for diabetic checkups, retinal exams, hypertension evaluations, lab tests, prescription fills, and other medical and service referrals. The clinic also is in great need of volunteer healthcare providers. There are a bunch of handouts on your table, but there's one specifically. So if you know of a healthcare provider, we welcome that person. I also would like to share a quote for you from a patient. Quote, I am so grateful for Rotacare. You saved my life. End of quote. That really touched my heart. I want to shout out to our Rotacare committee. The committee supports the free uh, obtaining restaurant donations to offer meals to the clinic volunteers. So a special thank you to our current restaurants, Las Gatas Cafe, Mimosa Gourmet, the Capital Club, Giorgio's and our loaves and fishes. The committee also delivers meals uh, for the volunteers, provides an annual volunteer recognition, organizes a donor reception, and recruits volunteers for the clinic. We are in great need currently for additional restaurants for the volunteer dinners. So please let us know if you're aware of any restaurant or deli that can help us in this effort. Now I'd like to um, turn it over to uh, JP, who is the Bay Area Rotacare Executive Director, and she will say a few words. JP? Good afternoon, everyone and fellow Rotarians. Thank you so much for this moment and this uh, giving us the opportunity to speak. I'm not gonna take too long. I know we have one more speaker. Um, but truly and sincerely, the Rotacare Bay Area Board and the Rotacare Bay Area 
um, staff is, uh, you know, commend San Jose for everything that they've done um, and the San Jose Rotary Club. You are an example that we talk about, uh, about how Rotary Clubs um, can help and assist Rotacare clinics in your local communities. So thank you and sincerely, um, you know, everyone who spends time on this and everyone who's devoted any amount of either dollars or time, um, we give a uh, thank you and, and applaud you. Thank you so much, JP. Thank you so much, Rotary, for your ongoing support of the operations of the clinic and also supporting the meal program. As I mentioned earlier, there are a number of handouts on the table which give you additional details regarding the clinic and some of their needs. Are there any questions before I close? Comments? Good question, thank you. Right now, because of COVID, the uh, clinic just reopened in April, and we're looking for six dinners, six to eight dinners. And usually when we ask for a commitment from a restaurant, we ask them to provide dinners on a quarterly basis. And currently we have to have packaged dinners. So they can't be like a, a plate of enchiladas or uh, lasagna like we used to do. Because our clinic is very limited, there are only six to eight people that are actually allowed in the clinic due to COVID restrictions. Any other questions? If not, thank you so much Rotarians and thank you, Steve. Thank you, Rose. A reminder, Thanksgiving program is being managed by Lenore Keeve. Uh, any of you who've been in Rotary for a while know this is one of the high points of the year. Please contact Lenore if you're interested and try to attend that week. Uh, you, you won't be sorry that you came and, and spent an hour listening to a dozen or so of your Rotarian friends talking about what they're thankful for. Uh, bring your own Kleenex too. Uh, Military Care Committee is asking members to sign up to participate in a uh, Veterans Day parade. So we'll meet at the uh, Arena Green. There will, there will be a bus. There's a bus in the, in the slide. Uh, it's, it's lots of fun, good companionship. The committee is working hard to do this. P please sign up. Uh, sign up now, if you would. Let's not put the thumb screws on that poor committee waiting until the last minute to get a bunch of us. To, to attend, and, and I, will, I will certainly be there. Um, Dave Silva and Catherine Tompkinson are here somewhere. Raise your hand. You too. There they are over on that side. Go talk to them afterwards if you can. Please sign up and, and uh, please be part of this event. It's really a, a beautiful event. Yes. And Fernando Zazueta is going to come up and say something. Fernando, come on up. Not much left to say, you said it all. <laughs> yeah, the idea here, and I think it's uh, basically, it's for two purposes. One of them is to honor our veterans. I mean, we really do owe them a great deal. I don't know how many of you are as saddened by the scene that we saw when we withdrew our arm, armed forces from Afghanistan. It was sad because we lost so many, so many were wounded and are living those lives forever changed. And we need to show physically our appreciation for what they did. The second reason why I think it's appropriate for us to go and participate in this event is because it makes Rotary look good to the community. You'll be riding in this bus You'll be able to get together with Rotarians afterwards at the Arena Green. There'll be uh, refreshments there. There'll be donuts for those of you who aren't um, diabetic. <laughs> and there'll be an opportunity for, for sharing uh, the goodwill that we uh, are known for and we should be better known for, as uh, Andrew Bales pointed out. This is no time for us to just sit back and enjoy the day off. This is a time for us to affirmatively say, yeah, 
I think I'll go out to um, help my club and uh, support this effort. The committee, the Veterans Committee, does a lot of this work on their own without any recognition from us. This attendance would be a way for us to show our appreciation for their work as well. So I'll be there, Steve will be there, and I hope that you, many of you can attend. Thank you. Thank you, Fernando. Uh, Red Badgers, uh, you should have a little card in front of you at your table, I hope. And if you do, see if there's the letter V or L or O on that card. And if there is, come on up. I've got a little gift for you. There's one. How about the other two? That's two. How about the third one? Come on up. Some wonderful wine compliments of our buddy Bert George, and it's And that wine, not surprisingly, is compliments of our buddy Bert George. And it, but but hold it. And today is Bert's 39th birthday, so we'll give him a round of applause. <laughs> and with that, is David Ginsburg here? Oh, David's on Zoom, I think, isn't he? So David is going to introduce today's speaker. Are we ready for David? President Steve, can you hear me? I, I'm, uh, I wish I could be there in person. It's the, cha the challenges of um, uh, having a job now in Santa Cruz. So let me start off my introduction of uh, Dr. Weber. Let me start with something I want people to pay close attention to this. Election officials face death threats across the country. That was the headline yesterday. Not in Hungary or Venezuela, but in USA Today. Our speaker, Dr. Shirley Weber, is all too familiar with these stories. Appointed California Secretary of State by Governor Gavin Newsom, she enthusiastically agreed to lead the country's largest elections office, which also places her at the center of the national storm. I have known Dr. Weber since she was a school board member in San Diego, and Californians are truly fortunate to have such a tireless advocate for protecting and extending voting rights, including restoring voting rights for individuals who have completed their prison term. Born to parents who were sharecroppers in Hope, Arkansas, during the segregationist Jim Crow era, for Dr. Weber, the fight for free and open elections is personal. Her father left Arkansas for California after being threatened by a lynch mob. He did not have the opportunity to vote until he was in his 30s. Growing up in the Pueblo de Rio housing project in South Los Angeles, Dr. Weber is a living testimony to the power of public education. She's a proud product of California public schools, which included UCLA, where she earned three degrees, including her PhD at only 26 years old. As one of the few black women in Southern California navigating academia in the late 60s and 70s, Dr. Weber ascended to become one of the youngest ever professors at San Diego State, where she helped found the Africana Studies Department. Over the years of more than 20 years in public service from the San Diego Board of Education, State Legislator, and now the Secretary of State's office, it is this personal story that has both guided her and prepared her to be the face of California elections. An African-American woman, she is the embodiment of the aspirational hope and promise of, the, of American democracy. Please welcome my friend, Secretary of State Shirley Weber. Thank you very much, David. And thanks to all of you for the invitation to be with you today. Um, uh, I it, the Rotary is always a special experience for me because when I was on the school board in San Diego, our Rotary there was always very active and involved in our schools, and uh, and they did some unique things that others didn't do. But but they had a signature kind of program in terms of working in uh, several of our schools with the issue of um, counseling for young people uh, that oftentimes the school districts didn't fund, and so. Uh, the work that you do, uh, it's really, really amazing. And uh, I thank you for not only just doing it once, but doing it over and over again. The fact that you have a, a real grounded foundation in community service and working in your community is really to be commended. And I'm really grateful for that. 
thanks to Zoom, I'm glad to be with you. Had a very busy uh, day yesterday and this morning as well. So getting to San Jose uh, was uh, going to be a difficult task, if not an impossible one. So I'm grateful that we were able to be with you on Zoom. It's one of the, I guess, one of the perks of, 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 of the pandemic. If we can think of something that good comes out of this, one of it would be the fact that uh, folks have become much more tech savvy. And, uh, and we can be in many places at one time, and, and that's good and bad at the same time. Uh, you know, I'm honored to be uh, the Secretary of State. It was not, I have to be very uh, honest, it was not something that had ever come to my mind as a kid growing up in the projects, but neither did being in the legislature. Um, I loved education and felt that the greatest thing I could ever do was be a teacher, and that is still true today. Um, and that's the career that uh, basically fuels a lot of my energy and a lot of my uh, passion with regards to what we do for young people, what we do for communities that are often left out, what we do as a nation, and how we defend the democracy that is uh, very fragile at this point, and that we all have a responsibility to do something uh, regarding that. Um, so when the governor asked me to be Secretary of State, uh, it was really, it took a lot of um, thought and prayer on my part to think about doing it because I loved what I was doing in the legislature. I, I was entering my fifth term and um, and was basically looking forward to retirement after the after the next term. Uh, but when the opportunity came, I had to think about it and realize that, as pointed out by by uh, David, uh, the secretaries of states are being threatened across the country and across the nation. And um, and some are being asked to do things that are totally um, illegal and and would be detrimental to us as a as a as a nation and as communities across the nation and, and particularly our place in the world where we have defended the democracy and we defended the concept of one person one vote so that regardless of what your socioeconomic status may be uh, you have the same power as someone who uh, as one of the wealthiest persons in the world because you have one vote and say, so do they. And, uh, and that in itself is really the foundation for a, a, a participatory democracy with regards to the public. Yeah, most secretaries of state enter, I've only been in office since um, the end of January, the last day in January. And most secretaries get at least two years before they have to deal with elections, before they have to deal with a statewide election uh, because of the time that they're elected and in about a year and a half or two, they have an election. Well. Uh, beginning this year, as you've probably seen, we've had lots of elections. We've had lots of shifts and moves and people moving in other areas. We had a significant number of special elections, and some of you were uh, in, in your communities were involved in special elections for city council and, and, and members of various school boards and so forth and so on. So we've, we've had a number of elections, but we generally don't have statewide elections. And so coming into office in just a few months, being thrust in the middle of a recall election uh, that is a statewide election that has different kinds of um, uh, requirements and issues that are there, but also puts, and because of the nature of the election itself, not just a regular election, but a recall, immediately puts Sandy, uh, puts, puts uh, San Jose, uh, San Francisco, all of the cities in California really on spotlight on CNN to be able to look at and see what's happening. This was historic in terms of an election. So uh, walking into an immediate situation where I'm being sued by everybody, including the governor, uh, concerning uh, the recall election and the elements of it, and then having to really structure an election that had very little information about how it's supposed to operate. Uh, and lots of folks looking at it and wanting to change it and do things in midstream, which uh, would not have been to the best uh, interest of the state to even begin to talk, start tinkering with uh, the recall election while you're in the middle of a recall, especially since so much of the conversation around elections right now is about um, fraud and people concerned that the, the things are being manipulated, that our, our election is not secure, and it goes on and on. And, um, and so it's really important that what we do uh, in terms of election is clear, uh, it's transparent, that we're, we're uh, pretty focused on what we have to do in order to maintain uh, the elections. So you've given me a long list of things that you like to hear about. And of course, I probably won't get to all of those things, but uh, but I, you know, I, I, I realize also that I probably owe you a visit to San Jose in person. Uh, and so at some point, maybe we'll get a chance to talk about some of those. And I know you're on a strict timeline. Uh, you want to talk about voter security. Some of you have talked, want to, want to know about voter security and how our election system is and how secure it is or not. And I want to invite any of you to um, uh, to basically visit your registrar voters. I was in San Jose's 
uh, Santa Clara's office uh, last week, as well as Monterey and in San Benito. And, and each one of them have their certain protocol, but all of them have a sense of transparency, uh, particularly in Monterey, where they have a, a hallway that you can see everything that's going on uh, in terms of the ballot counting and how the signatures are verified and all kinds of things. And so it's really interesting that most of our uh, registrar voters now have, have begun to say clearly, we want to make sure that we're very transparent that what we're doing is, is being seen by all. Um, the right to vote is just that. It is a right that we have to vote. And we work very hard to secure that every um, eligible Californian has the right to vote and that no one abuses it. Uh, we have worked hard to register uh, a number of individuals. California right now is at its highest point of registration. We have, I think it's 88 point some percent of all eligible voters are actually registered to vote right now in California. Uh, we're working hard to get to 90 and to 100% uh, so that everyone is actually registered. Every eligible California is registered. Um, and we um, and that means those who are, are citizens, U.S. citizens, residents of California, and 18 years and over are eligible to vote in California. Uh, we have done some, um, some things in expanding the vote, uh, like for those, as, as was mentioned, on parole, uh, they're able to vote, and, and that was done uh, uh, through, through the ballot initiative last year. And as a result, we saw an increase in, in those folks coming to the polls. Um, we have a number of things in protocol that make sure that we, we, we don't have people double dipping in voting. Some people want to know, how do you know this? How do you, how do you maintain this? And so we do have various systems with regards to voter integrity. Um, you know, our, our uh, election officials in the 58 counties, they, um, they really um, scour their roles and do their role maintenance on a regular basis. We get data every month from those who died, those who have been uh, charged with different felonies or in, who are incarcerated, and, and those who want to change their addresses. So we regularly go through those lists and make sure that that, that, uh, that, that is happening, that there's not a double uh, address and so forth and so on, or more than or, or double individuals registered in a place. Um, we ensure that, uh, that you cast only one ballot before tabulating a ballot. So we make sure that every vote basically has been uh, examined and, uh, and everyone has voted and they only vote once. So there's a way in which we can do that through vote, vote count to make sure that there aren't people registered up and down the state. Uh, we have some of the strictest uh, elections testing system in the in the world, and uh, we use these um, on a regular basis. And it's it's a, it's a it's a system where we basically code everything that um, that you you can. We have mail ballots now. That's the law that everyone will get a mail ballot. Uh, but that mail ballot is your ballot. It is identified by a barcode that's on the outside, and it examined. We can check every signature on. If you get a chance to go and walk into your registrar voter's office during an election, you will discover that we check every signature that's there. And there's a system and, and a machinery that helps the, the, the folks who are sitting there who are actually verifying that this is actually a person's signature. So we, we basically count every, um, every vote that's there. Uh, we also are strict on the chain of, of custody, who can, who can have it and who cannot have access to codes and, and various other things that are security pieces. Uh, and it has and it requires more than one person, several several individuals to basically deal with the codes that are there. Uh, and after and we do post election, we do what uh, what is uh, uh, what was, is called uh, uh, when we begin to look at the ballots afterwards to verify that what we've done is correct. And so we do that. We we're able to uh, look at we're able to basically uh, what we call um, to uh, take our ballots to examine them to make sure that those are the ones that we counted. And then after that. We pull up like 1%, we pull 1% of ballots randomly uh, out of different sections and those are counted by hand and they're matched to see whether or not they're, they're ma basically matching the, um, the ballots that are, ba that are uh, tallied by machine. So there is, a, there is a, a, a complimentary effort that takes place to make sure that, uh, that the, the counting is valid. All of our machines are um, tested and retested uh, and they have to be, all of our printers have to be um, certified by the state. There are none that are certified by private entities on the side. So all of our machines at any particular time, uh, when we're getting ready for election, every machine will be tested uh, and, and, and validated. 
So we, we work very hard to make sure that those things are clear and, and, and able to be seen. Uh, election security, um, we have an, an entire office of election cybersecurity in the office, and they basically are uh, amplify all of our security efforts to make sure that we're guarding ourselves against misinformation and disinformation. So regularly you will see information on our website about what theories or what concepts are out there that people put out there and whether or not it's true or not. Um, we have uh, various sources up and down the state who work with us on this to make sure that we look very carefully at uh, social media and what they're saying and making sure that those things are not correct and making as much effort as we possibly can to correct it. Uh, we work around the clock uh, with, um, with the various officials regarding reliable information about the elections and multiple opportunities for people to, uh, to vote, to begin with the vote by mail and then move forward with that. Um, we do a number of things with tactical security. So we have an office, as I said, of election security uh, that conducts area-wide and agency security assessments and upgrade firewalls and so forth and so on. A major operation in our office in terms of making sure that there's cybersecurity. Uh, we know that none of our voting machines can be connected to any internet, so that the ability of the those on the internet to penetrate uh, our election system, none of them are connected to the internet. You can go through any of their offices and you will not see that any of the machines connected to the internet so that there's no effort to do that. So there's a lot of work that goes into election security. We try to make sure that all of our files are accurate uh, and, uh, and, when, and if there are questions, we respond to them as quickly as we possibly can. Uh, but like I said, we have one of the strictest systems in the world in terms of requirement when others look at Secretary of State's offices and elections in California, because it is such a large operation, we have some of the best in terms of security. Um, it's interesting that, uh, you know, in addition to that, I wanna just say that some of you asked questions about the recall about uh, petitions and, uh, and how those things are, are, are certified. Um, In-person voting, as someone mentioned, is on a decline. And we see that with the vote by mail. If you look at um, elections that occurred even uh, in the last, uh, yesterday, there were a number of elections in, in cities and counties uh, special elections that for election for officers as well as those that are the regular elections for the mayors of some small cities. And in each case, um, you know, what, what has happened is that we mail out the ballots and you will see uh, that the counting is done rather quickly because there are very few people who actually go to the polls to vote anymore. Uh, we looked at the recall and it was a very small percentage that actually showed up the vast majority of the votes uh, came in uh, by mail. And so mail is becoming very important. And that is an issue because as we, as we, as mail becomes a much more popular means, uh, there's some requirements that they have to have so many polling places per, per, per number of individuals in a city. And we're looking at that because uh, many registrar voters are saying, you know, we don't have anyone show up. We have no one coming in to vote three days before, four days before. And surely the one of the requirements for the VCA counties, the Voter Choice Act counties, is that they had to have a, a, a polls open for 11 days. Well, many of them noted no one showed up 11, 10, 9, 8, none of those days. They actually showed up maybe a couple of days before. And oftentimes they show up to turn in the ballot. So we are looking at, and obviously that's going to be a major issue in the legislature, is whether or not we can continue to use that as one of the requirements for being a BCA county, that you have to have 11 days of voting. And most of our registrar voters have said it's too many days, particularly in small counties uh, when no one is there. And that's a cost factor that's there where we have to rent facilities and we have to hire people to be there and so forth and so on. So we're looking at that to see whether or not uh, that, that is still true, that, that we need to have these numbers that, uh, that basically dictate the number of polls you have to have in a particular community. Uh, in a VCA county, as you know, we have the vote centers. So therefore that operates a little bit differently with a larger base than, than necessarily the actual precinct uh, polling places that we've had in the past. So we're looking at that as this evolves, keeping in mind that we've only had uh, ballot mail to everyone in the last election of 2020 in November and now the recall election. But since then, the governor has signed uh, into law, the fact that every uh, every citizen will receive a vote by mail ballot, and uh, and that is a uh, some have already raised concern that well that you know we, the expense of doing it, uh, but if we see that what we see it as the as the positive of it is the larger number of people voting uh, because they have options they don't have to wait for one day one moment 
uh, one weekend, they can actually vote at home, they can uh, turn their ballot in themselves and or else. So we're looking at that though, because there are some savings that we think can be made without compromising people's right to vote. Um, the recall, uh, obviously, if you're interested, there is um, a committee that's formed between the two houses right now, the Senate and the Assembly, and they are looking at recall, the possibility of reviving or, or making some adjustments and changes to the recall. Uh, the recall is very complicated to, to change. And, and even though we're looking at ways in which we can do it, it's almost every, every change requires an additional change. And uh, every recommendation has something else attached to it. Um, it is, uh, some argue that our system is too easy, that it, the numbers required to do recall in California, which is true, is less than most other states. Most other states base, base their number that you have to have on the total registered voters, voters not those who just participated in the last election. Uh, so there's a greater number that they're pulling from. Most states, many of the states have 15 to 30 percent required, but we have 12 and a half percent required uh, in, uh, in terms of gubernatorial recalls. So there's some, there's some concern that it makes it easier easier for people to do recalls in California, and therefore the expense is great. Uh, there is no, uh, some want to make sure that we have a um, cause for recall, which, which sounds good, but it would also require us to develop some type of border commission that would evaluate the, the, the rationale for recall uh, that would be there. And so, but, but nonetheless, most of us think that, uh, you know, there should be a reason why that the, that the recalls are done. And, and the law does not require um, any just it requires that you tell why you why the person should be recalled, but it doesn't require anyone to evaluate that. Even though the application says you have to, you have to write a justification, there's no one to evaluate whether or not your justification is worthy. It, it really is whether it's a a, a a a good cause or not, or whether it's just something that you don't like this, so therefore you want to recall it. So we are looking at that. There's a joint committee looking at it. In addition to the joint committee. I have a separate advisory committee that's going to be dealing with recall that will uh, help me in my assessment of what the legislature recommends and uh, to make sure hopefully that we can recommend some things that are not partisan, that are really uh, just good government kind of activities or things that need to be done with regards to the recall. So we're looking at that. And hopefully, in my understanding, the committee's meeting, I met, I spoke at the committee last Thursday. They, they will be meeting and um, uh, they are, if you want to know about them, if you go to the website of any of the uh, elections committee for the assembly or the Senate, you can see the dates that they've identified as when they will have hearings on the recall. And, you, and they're, and they're um, uh, they're done over over the uh, uh, website, so so any of you can listen in and hear what is being said at the recall. Uh, some have asked about qualifying initiatives, ballots, and referral processes, and recall. All of those things are. Um, I understand those who are working on doing the recall legislation. All of those are items of concern. Uh, California is one of the few states that has a a, a pop a pop, has the the proposition initiative effort that the public can actually initiate something and get it placed on the ballot. Uh, there, many states don't have that. Uh, California does, and and uh, and it's a mixed bag between those who think it's a great idea and those who don't. Some are greatly concerned that most of the initiative process that we had thought for thought would, would give greater uh, greater input to. Uh, the public and give them an op opportunity to speak. But the reality is, is many of the many of the propositions are funded by either someone outside of our state or by a small entity that has the money to fund the the uh, the, the signatures and so forth and so on. And as a result, I, the proposition comes out and uh, and it's not really necessarily from the public, but it's from those uh, uh, special interests outside the state of California and some special interests in California. So that is an ongoing concern as to how do you how do you revive that? How do you uh, revise it so that it really is the, the public that has a voice and not others? I'm going to stop now because I know you have some questions that I'm supposed to answer if anyone has them. Uh, I'm more than happy to answer questions about what we do in the Secretary of State's office, what our great, greatest challenges are as we move forward. And one of them obviously is the whole issue of making sure that people feel good about voting, they feel secure, and that we uh, are constantly pushing uh, the transparency issues and those issues that others will continue to to question us. Um, I consistently say to folks, we do the best we can to to make sure that any um, any complaints that people have are unfounded. And uh, because we know there were people who will always have complaints, there are still people who say there was fraud in the in the recall election and threatening our lives and so forth and so on as a result of it. And so even though the, the, the recall had a huge margin, not a squeaker margin, a huge margin, 
Uh, people still felt it was um, it was rigged, and and so they will continue to do that. I simply say to my staff, we can't control what people say, but we can control what we do, which means we can make sure that whatever allegations they have are not founded, and that is not true. And that's what we work to do. So with that, I'm more than happy to answer any questions about the Secretary of State's office, what we do, and what our uh, you know what our goals are. Uh, as as be, be, most of your questions were about. Um, elections. Keep in mind that the office also handles all business entities, all business filings and nonprofits. Uh, and that's really the largest part of the Secretary of State, the largest staff. And also we are responsible for California archives and you should be able to, uh, we have an amazing collection and you should be able to access our archives online uh, to see what we have as well as the, if you have things that you like to think should be in the archives that represent San Jose, uh, we are available to do those things as well. So with that being said, are there any questions that I'm more than happy to answer? Thank you, Dr. Weber. Uh Before we enter the q and I want to remind Red Badgers that you have a special pass. You can go right to the front of the line when there are questions being asked. So just remember that. With that, we'll start with uh, Fernando Zazueta. Uh, thank you, Dr. Weber. You've got your hands full here with this mailing in ballots. I just wondered how uh, is it handled when so many of our people move, especially renters, but uh, people seem to move regularly and how do you keep track of that the other one a question i just was wondering about in this mailing that you compare signatures i know my signature has changed substantially over the years how especially as many years as i've lived so i was just wondering how do you handle that well you know two things well first of all the issue of movement um yeah clearly lots of folks move and some people move and never change their um the registration because they want because they move so much they want the registration to made at their parents house or or something of that place that the stable place for them to be and and that's you know and that's okay uh, our concern is that you can't uh, you can't vote twice so we're not we're not having folks moving and changing registration and changing so we we try to if people change their address that's what we we do we basically change uh, make that change in the in the system but if they decide as some kids you know who live with their parents and they uh, move to the dorm, they move from here, they move to there. As long as they have one place that they vote, uh, that is okay. That, uh, we do the change in address mainly to make sure that we are not sending out two ballots to, to a person in two different addresses. Um, your other question with regards to uh, what are we going to do about, I'm, I'm blocking now on it because I think it was, um, tell me again, what was it? Uh, uh, I, I can't remember the other question. What, Signatures. What? Signatures. signatures. Oh, okay. Comparing signatures. The signatures, if you get a chance to go look and see, your signature does change over time. There's no question. And those who are specialists in that area, because there's a group that's a specialist in it and they have a machine, they know that your signatures changed over time. If there is any question about the validity of your signature, then you would be contacted by the registrar of voters and, and, and basically asked to update your signature or, or to verify surely that this is your signature. Um, and so, but the, but we take in consideration that people change. I mean, most of us have been voting since we were in our early 20s, and uh, and we probably had a great great signature at that time, and now it's changed. And so, but the but the folks, the machine that they use is able to basically detect those kinds of issues that are there. And when it is the situation where there truly is a a difference between not just the age with the signature, but basically a different signature. Uh, those ballots are pulled, uh, and then they are uh, the person is contacted to verify. In, and we pull them if you don't have a signature on there as well. They're pulled, and the person whose ballot it is is contacted uh, and uh, and asked to either verify their signature, to do a new signature, uh, or those kinds of things, or to come and sign their ballot. Uh, but um, but we do do that, and there's a method. I'm I'm not an expert in it, but I've seen people do it. And they can basically verify your signature that's changed over time. They recognize that. Before the next question, Dr. Weber, uh, we've got a number of people who'd like to ask questions. Insofar as you can answer the questions briefly, we'd appreciate it so we can maximize the number of questions asked. With that, uh, Art Weisbrot. Which states have the worst laws with respect to voter suppression and which aspects of voter suppression are the worst? You know, I don't know who has the worst. I, I mean, the, some of the stuff that we hear is, is kind of crazy. I know Texas has uh, some really restrictive laws. Uh, Georgia, and many of them have come into place recently because 
Florida basically uh, changed its law with regards to ex felons, and so it loosened it up. But after the last election, we're seeing there were over 500 bills that have been introduced to restrict people's right to vote, and uh, and a lot of it revolves around. I know Georgia has lots of them that says you can't, uh, you know, you can't give some stuff somebody water who's standing in line, and that passed. And so all of that was because of the efforts of uh, Stacey Abrams to to increase the participation. So Georgia has things that we're concerned about that that we're weighing in on in terms of litigation. Uh, Texas has a number of things that are that are uh, troubling in terms of voter ID uh, and as well as who can use uh, who can get absentee ballots, whether or not you can have a permanent absentee versus you having to file every time and do notary. So notary with it. So there are a lot I, I, I could go into, it, but there are lots and lots of them that are out there over 500 bills. And, and many of them have gotten through their houses and signed by their government. Uh, Dr. Weber, thank you for being here today. Um, Putting on the spot just a little bit, I'm wondering, as our elections leader, when you talk, you touched on the uh, the issue of the propositions in this initiative process. What what reform specifically would you recommend as our elections leader to that process? What can we do better or differently regarding the initiative process, the ease it is to get in, the things that you noted, the the money, the influence. What can we do differently to to make that better? You know, I, I, I think, you know, and it, and it cuts both ways. And I've said this to those who are very upset about the fact that we have very wealthy folks who do this. But even there, any many of our, our um, nonprofit or kind of nonprofit 501c4, I think it is, uh, organizations sometimes organize themselves and put money into getting signatures. The initiative process was supposed to be a grassroots effort. And uh, and there have been many bills that have come before the House that have not passed in, in uh, before the Assembly here and the Senate that dealt with funding of, of initiatives, allowing people to pay people to take get signatures, all those kinds of things make it easier for folks to, to basically get these petitions signed. Uh, you could have a higher standard in terms of the percentage that's required. And each uh, county has a different number. And so we could standardize that to make it say 25 or 30% of the electorate has to want to put this bill on, or want to put this issue on the ballot. Um, so those kinds of things I think it would make it so that you really are getting the voice of the people rather than the voice of you know, the bail bondsmen or the, uh, the tobacco industry or those kinds of folks who have chosen to do this initiative process in order to, to circumvent the legislature that may have passed some bills that they didn't think were desirable for them and, and basically circumvent the, the wishes of the public by misinformation and campaigns and so forth and so on. So I think changing, um, you know, uh, I, most folks would argue we, could, we should just get rid of the initiative process, but I think Californians would go crazy if we did that. Um, but when we look at what the initiative process does, it, it has oftentimes passed laws that are illegal, and so therefore people go to court, you sue, and they're thrown out anyway. Uh, sometimes there's uh, initiatives that were done, like the bail, removing bail, and everybody, it was a huge initiative with the Supreme Court and everybody else to get rid of bail. We got rid of bail, and immediately the bail bonds would put millions of dollars in a campaign, set a person up, and before we know it, what people had fought for and had written about, the Supreme Court had, had weighed in on years and years and years about the unfairness and the injustice that happens in bail with poor people who are poor, and it doesn't stop people from committing crimes. All of that was tossed out in an initiative by a tremendous amount of money in the last election. And people were devastated by the fact that folks didn't know what they were voting for. They thought they were voting to get rid of bail and then actually they were voting to reinstate bail. And so there's a lot of uh, challenges there that deals with the initiative process. And um, I'm not sure if any one thing would do it other more than probably keeping money out of it. And that would be a difficult task to do. Uh, one final question, Dr. Weber, and if, Dave, if you can make your question brief, and Dr. Weber, if you can please make your answer brief, I'd appreciate it. Okay, I'll try. Thank you again for your time. Uh, given that you have a seat at the table around the governor's office with leadership there, and uh, the secure systems by which you uh, spoke of around the voting system, is, do you have any opinion about how uh, the state might fix the unemployment mess that's cost us $20 billion <laughs> that the businesses will end up paying for? You know, uh, you asked a good and funny question, and I can answer that very quickly. No, I don't have the answer to that. Uh, clearly, someone did not scrub those roles in terms of social services and, and the unemployment with regards to where people were. I mean, to mail ballot, to mail checks to uh, prisons is really unusual. 
And somebody was obviously not watching very carefully where they should have been sending the resources. So uh, you're absolutely correct. I think they're still investigating and finding out who basically uh, rigged the system in some way. So uh, if I had that magic, I would definitely put it in that area. It was very frustrating for those who needed the resources and didn't get them. I understand that. But thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Dr. Weber, thank you very much for today's program. We appreciate it very much. And a contrib contribution has been made on your behalf to the Voting Rights Alliance. Uh, with that, can we give Dr. Weber a round of applause, please? And next week, our speaker will be Michelle Mallory Peacock, Global Head of Public Policy for Waymo, speaking on Waymo and driverless cars. With that, a meeting adjourned.